the cables that go uh, through to Singapore today. So that gives us an additional capacity base. And think about it for a second with the map that I mentioned before at the very beginning. If I go back, uh, sorry about this, it takes a second to go back all the way. There's two significant data resources just there. There's the SKA in Perth and the SKA in South Africa. Whilst those two do not need to transmit data between each other, they will be producing a large volume of data that will be read by other entities throughout the world, such as what happens with CERN in the sense of the Large Hadron Collider. So part of this is Arnet also preparing itself for redundancy so that we can actually deliver data from the SKA and other instruments in Australia through to the world in a reliable fashion. So one of the things that adds to this is the fact that we have a NREN regional context. And when I say context, that is we are challenged as NRENs globally, there's a number of us, who are responsible for trying to connect small islands, uh, emerging economies, things like that, with research and educational resources so that they can actually uh, participate in learning and higher education. So one of the things that comes with that, oops, sorry, is Gorex. So Gorex was, was created by the University of Guam and the reason being is that, as you can see on this, this map from submarine maps, you can see there are a number of cable systems all entering Guam. And so it made an ideal point for actually delivering services between NREN so that we could actually interconnect and do a transit point so that we could actually pass traffic to each other without having to go all the way to the US, like you see here, and then back to Asia. So Gorex has been established and is currently uh, operational and there are more and more uh, peers connecting there as we grow. Arnet will be appearing there hopefully end of the year or early next year. Along with this is the fact that the FCCN, Hawiki Cable and the JGA Cable System also provide additional connectivity and spurs for the Pacific nations, Pacific Island countries. So this allows us to pick up other entities such as Fiji, with alternative capacity, uh, Samoa, American Samoa, and other entities so that we can then make sure that they are connected as best possible to the, the global research and education network. So I've, I've mentioned the SKA a few times. I'm gonna give you an example of why NRENs care about capacity. So this slide talks about the fact that there was a transfer done between Canberra and London and it was done between two NRENs to test how long it would take to actually pass 100 terabytes of data between the two NRENs. Now, you might be wondering, why is it only at 10 gig? Well, the reason being is the two test servers were only connected at 10 gig because that was the hardware that was available for this test. The other thing is, this test was done completely blind. No one in the operational teams knew this test was occurring. This was done without any network engineering resources applied. This was just two sysadmins point to point doing some testing. So what they did is they transferred the 100 terabytes and measured some data. And so what was interesting is that going through NREN to NREN to NREN to deliver the data, they were able to sustain 9.2 gigabits a second and deliver that 100 terabytes of data in 34 hours. When they tried and pushed the traffic through public internet uh, services, at 10 gig, they were rate limited down to 1.7 gigabits on one service provider, which then meant that it would take 183 hours to download the file. And then another service provider, which dropped even further down and actually dropped to 0.11 gigabits per second. Further trials have been done by other NRENs around the world. And what's interesting is the fact that you have service providers who treat our traffic flows as if they're DDoSes they drop them. They simply squash the traffic and say, we're not gonna let that through. So whilst this is legitimate traffic, it doesn't appear to the DDoS systems as legitimate traffic and therefore they drop it. 
So this is one of the reasons why this is really important that we have high speed capacity and that we can throw the data around as we need it. So I mentioned why we're going into Asia previously, but some of the other reasons behind it is this graph here. And this graph here is about how Arnet is enabling our researchers within Australia to actually collaborate with our researchers, with researchers in the US, UK, China, Germany and Canada. And the big highlight here, and I'll point out that this graph, this was, data was taken uh, last year, uh, sorry, 2016, but the big red spike is China. That's who we're doing most of our collaborative research with at the moment. So this is part of the reason why Arnet is really pushing towards wanting to have more capacity into the Asia region and growing our connectivity there. So I mentioned before about the fact that we don't get told when traffic happens. We just get it's on the network. So one of the things this shows is uh, Arnet runs what is traditionally known as a white space network. Most service providers run pretty much a flat tack network as much as possible in the sense that they want to get the best value for their links as possible. So normally you would see a typical service provider will, at peak times, will run their links to approximately 80 to 90% to try and utilize the resource as much as possible. As I said, Arnit is a white space network, plenty of white space there. So this is actually a researcher doing traffic that, again, they didn't tell us. The only reason we picked this up is one of us actually looks at the graphs each day and went, hey, that was an interesting spike, let's go back and have a look. And in this particular case, this was some data being transferred between Australia and Chicago Starlight uh, for a demonstration by some researchers for KLM Airlines. And this was about how they could move data off an airplane about all of the details about its maintenance, history, all the information that's stored on the airplane as fast as they could to, to home base. And so uh, this was the demonstration that was used. But it gives you an idea. So they actually pushed 74 gigabits a second uh, over the link uh, between Chicago and Australia with no notice on the network. So again, why does this matter to Arnet? Well, look at the fact that genome sequencing is transforming lives. We've got modeling of impacts of the climate change. Whether or not you believe in climate change is irrelevant. People are actually modeling it. There's the square kilometer array, what's being built. There's the experiments that are being done in the high energy physics departments in the US, in Europe, Asia. And so it really does make a difference if we can transfer that data quickly so the researcher isn't waiting for it to be delivered. And so that's what Arnet's about. That's our goal is to enable, we're, not, we're meant to be a friction free network. We're meant to enable. And so with that, I will finish and ask if there's any questions. I see a shark circling. Hey, this is Gora from AWS Warwick. Uh, good, good presentation, thank you. Um, kind of shows why r and &E stuff is important. Now, the usual question, uh, do you have any more ideas about uh, V4 versus V6? Uh, do you have any other telemetry that is useful? And you talked quite a bit about the SOPSI, and I know why, because we asked you to. You did. Uh, how do you solve the last mile problem? Because that is so, another really difficult part of this equation, right? Thank so you. So in Arnett's particular case, uh, we are a licensed telecommunications carrier, so we actually do build our own fiber. Um, so in some situations, depending on where where the end user might be, we will do some calculations to see whether or not it's financially viable for Arnet to do a build just for that one customer, or if there is a number of people or a number of entities along the way that would make it more viable for us to do financially. The other side of that is if the entity is in far remote places, uh, such as the square kilometre away, which is about 500 kilometres plus north of Perth and then about 250 kilometres inland, um, the government actually puts together some funding models and then uh, the entities can then ask Arnet to tender for that and that's what happened in the case of the square kilometre array. So Arnet has actually built fibre all the way from Perth to the square kilometre array 
and we can light it up with as many circuits as we want based on whatever optical infrastructure we have. Getting back to your telemetry question, um, we do have telemetry. Um, so we've been running IPv6 since 2003 in a dual stack environment. We have some data sources that show how much traffic is IPv6 versus IPv4. Um, I didn't put those in the slide pack because I wasn't sure how much time I was going to get. Um, but I am happy to talk about that. But I can tell you that the predominant use of IPv6 in our network is predominantly to Google. Um, there are uh, some research entities such as in China that we do a lot of IPv6 traffic with. Uh, but predominantly, uh, domestically, you see a lot of it for YouTube. Thank you. What next? That's a good question. Um, at the moment, we're going through a review of our routing infrastructure and our optical infrastructure. And so we're looking at how we can build uh, better data center switching infrastructure for some of our services. Um, we have a platform that stores, uh, we provide basically one, uh, 100 gigabytes per university researcher on a cloud storage service. Um, that's visible and they can then uh, collaborate with other users through that. It's got the usual Jupyter um, notebooks and so forth applied to it so you can process data as a group. Um, but you can also collaborate in the sense of passing, uh, forming a group based on your research uh, background. So you could be doing bioinformatics, you could be doing uh, you know, astronomy, uh, there's a whole range of things that you can use. So that system uh, is part of the reason that's driving some of our growth. Um, we also have other systems such as Zoom, Panopto, where universities are recording their lecturers because we're seeing a lot of students actually doing uh, their sessions from home. They're not always going to campus. Um, so that's also changing things a bit. So there's, we're looking at lots of different ways that we can reduce the cost, but at the same time increase the capacity. Thank you very much. Oh, you got a question. Sure. I have a question for Warwick. Uh, my question was around how does Arnet um, get along with the incumbents in Australia? Do you find the incumbents are friendly and you work well with them, or are you seen as a competitor stealing big customers from them? Um, I have to be careful how I answer. Um, the, the reality is that, as I said before, because Arnet is a non-for-profit entity, we generally are seen as not too much of a competitor. Uh, because we have a very limited scope in terms of how, who and what we can sell to. Uh, so generally speaking, we don't have too much of a problem with the large incumbents um, and vice versa. Thanks. No worries. Thanks for it. You're welcome. All right. Uh, just a reminder on the sound, um, it is terrible on the edges. So if you're struggling to hear, move to the middle. Um, okay, next up is um, Arnold Nipper from DKICS. Um, Arnold's going to have a chat to us about discovering remote peering at IXPs. Uh, so please welcome Arnold. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Hopefully everyone wakes up. I'm too loud? I am? No. So maybe that's um, because I'm, I'm hearing impaired that also I would like, if you have a question, please speak loud, so as loud as I do. So as you see already from my title, I'm only presenting. Um, I'm none of the researchers. What I do today is presenting uh, a re research which was carried out by the fourth research institute in Lancaster University and researchers both from DKIX and AM6. Just to recover, uh, what is an internet exchange? Basically an internet exchange is a layer two infrastructure where providers connect to to uh, directly interconnect their networks to exchange traffic. And internet exchanges came up in the early 90s, and 1990s, 
uh, when BGP was around just to uh, facilitate to keep local traffic local. That, that was the early idea, and this is still a paradigm what you feel. Internet exchange is keep local traffic local, but that does not necessarily mean that only traffic from local networks is exchanged at an internet exchange. And this is how we see it over there. There is a layer two infrastructure. This is highly simplified. It's a simple switch over here. Then you have the customer around it. Around it. They typically connect with an Ethernet interface into the switching fabric. Nowadays, the um, internet hubs or as internet exchanges are more complicated. They are not simple uh, switches, but mostly in most cases, uh, all around the data centers in a wider area. So as I already said, is uh, the basic idea of an internet exchange really was for networks all around to um, directly exchange the, the traffic. Basically, when the first internet exchanges came up, until then, for example, we in Germany, we had to send traffic to the US just to be able to um, connect to another network, which was also in Germany. So that, of course, massively reduces cost, but not only that, the second point is also, uh, besides reducing costs, definitely is uh, to re reduce delay and to improve overall performance. Over time, the pressure for diverse peering grew because of uh, increasing of volume of internet traffic through CDNs, and that means that the networks had to connect to more and more internet exchange point. Um, this is how the traditional internet exchange or setup for a provider looks like. There is a provider with a network, and, and then he started to build out in each internet exchange. That means for him to have a line into a hub somewhere, put a router over there, connect to the fabric, being able to exchange traffic with all the other networks. So, and it did not take long that providers said, okay, I want to be able to connect to an internet exchange because it's not only about uh, reducing costs, the other big advantage also is that at an internet exchange you are able to directly connect to other networks. Whereas for transit, you never know what happens. You hand off your traffic to the transit networks and maybe that network also hands off to another one, to a third one, fourth one, and so on, until finally the traffic arrives at the destination. So what did they do? They long hauled into an internet exchange. And this is when the term remote peering came up. That means for the rest of this presentation, under remote peering, or RP, we understand when a network peers at an IXP without having physical presence in the IXP infrastructure and or through resellers. Resellers are a special type of networks. They more or less have a big pipe into the IXP's infrastructure and then have several VLANs where they uh, chop off smaller bandwidths and connect a lot of customers into. This is how it typically looks like, you see. Um, here is a provider which is a reseller with customer. He has a big pipe and then he hands off smaller chunks of bandwidth into the internet exchange. Please also be aware that remote peering already can happen if the network 
is in the same city, but not necessarily in a facility where the IXP is. That means he long lines, the long line even can mean that he is in the data center, which is only 500 meters away from where the IXP is. I already talked about it, what peer um, remotely, what the reasons for it is. It really makes it more cost effective for an uh, internet service provider or for a provider to connect to an exchange because he does not have to buy another router to, to put at the IXP's collocation. He does not have to take care for management, maintenance, and so on and so on. At that time, what also happened is that um, from a single router over here, um, an ISP then connects with multiple lines into multiple IXPs. This is on one hand, it saves costs for the ISPs, but the on, the, on the other hand, um, it also, of course, hides what really is in between the IXP's infrastructure and the next hop layer through router of the ISPs. For both the uh, provider as well as for the internet exchange, it makes it harder to monitor and debug and especially if a provider connects with a multiple IXP router into different IXPs, it reduces resilience and reliability. And perhaps what also happens is that it increases definitely maybe the latency between uh, the customers at the IXPs and the next stop of the remote peer. But you may argue that maybe would happen anyway because the next layer three after the router at the IXP would be at the same destination. Nevertheless, um, this is an issue which we want to look into in more de detail. So what is our goal for, or what was the goal for the research network to bring into transparency to identify remote and local peers for both IXP operators and customers' point of view, and also to look into more detail of features of remote peering, to study how characteristics of local peer, remote peer looks like, and whether we will be able to differentiate them. What it was or is the state of the art to identify a remote peer. So I guess everyone does come up with the idea. So what the metric is in networks is always the round trip time. So if you have a small round trip time, a little round trip time, you simply assume that you the provider is connected directly to the IXP or is a local connection. So what do you do? You just have smoke ping running around all the time and then you say everything, for example, which is more than 10 milliseconds round trip time away, you would say this is a remote peer. So if you look at data for round trip time, this is what, what they found out. In red, you have local peers, and the blue time, you have red, uh, the remote peers. And as you see, with almost 100% of the local uh, peers are within a round trip time of uh, 10 milliseconds. Whereas, uh, not so surprising, the minimum round trip time 
can go up as high as 100 milliseconds. But on the other hand, what you also see is that still 80% of remote peers have a round tip time less than one millisecond. I already mentioned this, that may be due to the definition of a remote peer. Said a local peer has to be in the IXP's facilities or to be more precise in the facility where the IXP is. Typically, at least in, in Europe, the collocation does not belong to the IXP. So this may be a reason or even if it's only 20 or 30 kilometers away, it still might uh, be able to have less than one millisecond round trip time. On the other hand, what they also found out, there is another term what uh, I would like to introduce you to you, this is the so-called wide area IXPs. So what are wide area IXPs? Wide area to, or the other way around. IXPs typically only have a diameter which is in a city, in a metropolitan area network, which has a distance of let's say 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 kilometers. I do not know, for example, London, the London Internet Exchange, I guess the diameter of the London Internet Exchange Slough would be the farthest away. It might be 50 kilometers or so. But then, Walter might be able to say, when NLIX came up 10 years ago or so, what they did is they interconnected more than one city and they spread, for example, what NLIX does, the same as was with DataX, uh, they are all over Europe. So then, of, all of a sudden, the IX had the diameter of hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. And this is what we call in wide area IXPs. And then, definitely, what you find out, of course, in the directionally, that means if you ping within the, the same city, you still will be able to have round trip times between up to, let's say, 10 milliseconds, but of course, if you ping in between cities, which will still be the definition of the IXPs, you have round trip times which uh, go up to 100 milliseconds or even maybe higher. This is another figure. They claim to be true. This may be true for the data set that 40% of our, all IXPs are wide area. I personally heavily doubt that this is true. We currently have around 650 ISPs, and that would mean that roughly 100 of them are wide area, and this is definitely not true. Nevertheless, this is from the figures for the IXPs under research. So as we have seen, round trip time is not enough to really uh, infer whether we have a local peer or we have a remote peer. So what did they come up with more principles and they call it the first principle approach. And first of all, what they do is to look into port capacity. The idea behind it is that nowadays if you find a um, participant at an IXP with low port capacity that he is not directly connected to the IXP. Because typically network who are, have their presence into one of the facilities at least connect with one gigabit, 10 gigabits or even more. Though so that means low port capacity then indicates that the network peer remotely. And even, for example, I know it from M6, the lowest speed you can directly buy from M6 is one gigabit. And if you see a participant 
at M6 connected with 500 max, please correct me, Hank, if I'm wrong, then it must be a remote peer. Remote peer because he only can come via reseller. So this is the first step, what they do if they are able to identify the port capacity, they look into the port capacity. What is the next? This is what we already know. This is the ping uh, round trip time measurement. I already t talked about that in, in detail. Nothing to say about more. Next is the collocation facilities. What they try to do is to get more information on where the network is. For example, if you look at peering DB, the networks are able to specify in which collocations they are. And then what the researchers do, the IXPs also say we are in this collocation, that collocation, that collocation, that collocation. And what they next did is try to match networks with IXPs to the same collocation. The fourth step is what I already also talked about is multi-IXP routers. That is a router which connects remotely into not only one IXP, but into more than one IXPs. And with TraceRoute, you are able to identify these multi-IXP routers. So, and if you see, okay, I do a TraceRoute that way and the TraceRoute that way, and for example, from the DNS or from whatever, from the IP addresses, you are able to really spot this is the same router, then it must be, or from the definition, it's a remote peering. And the next is what they call private connectivity over facilities. What they also do is to look into a network and to see whether it's directly connected to another network in the same facility. And if they found out that it is, then it's perhaps a, a local one because it's in the, in the same, because the second, the other network is directly connected to the IX. So, this is the algorithm and it works, and what they do, they exactly uh, go through the algorithm in the way I, I said. First, they look for capacity, um, port capacity, and if they find out that small port capacity, then it's most likely that's in remote peer. Next is the RTTs from uh, different vantage points, for example, also from, from the RIPE, uh, statistics to see where the, it's located, then with trace routes from different vantage points that they try to identify multi IXP routers, and then they look into the collocation data and lastly into direct connections. So this was a real lot of work, and what was the findings? So, with port capacity, they were able to spot 11% uh, of all networks with a precision of 96%, with the round trip time 76, with the highway precision, multi IXP, another 53, private links, an impressive 49, so that overall, they combined, they were able to identify. 93% of all um, networks with a precision of 95% and an accuracy of also almost 95%. So this is what they found out and now we want to look into more detail what that means. So what we see here is the top 30 ISPs which were under research in a three days period, 
last year. And what you see over here is the, what they found out by port times, the round tip chain Uncolo, multi IXP, or private connection. And on the y axis, you see the fraction of interferences they could make up. What we clearly see is from overall, still the, with RTT, uh, we are able, this really gives a good indication whether a um, network is remote peering or not. But still, we see that we have, depending on where we are, a high percentage. For example, this one is Equinix Ashburn, for example, from multi IXPs to identify those which you will not be able by, by RTT, for example. And even here over there, this is, where is it? Things is, I guess this is a, an IXP in Poland, where you have a high percentage where you find out by uh, direct interconnect, whether it's a local peering or remote peering. So overall, their findings is that by 10%, you already can say by, in, in, by simply looking at the port capacity that there is a correlation between local peering and remote peering. Another, or as mentioned, is most of it is attributed to RTT and multi IXP module. And what you cannot see from this statistics is that they found out that 25% of the multi-IXP routers even connect to more than 10 IXPs. The next statistic is, what did they hear? Let me look. So, yeah. Again, we have here the fraction of IX members, and then on the other axis, they look into the number of um, participants at an IX. And what you see here is that you simply can say the larger an IXP is, the more remote connections are at this IXPs. I said, so, so with the large one, they have 40% or even more of their members are remote IXPs, are remote members. And basically, uh, most of the remote peers um, most likely come from so-called resellers. What did they also look into is the growth rate. So they thought, okay, let's look how the connection rate at an IXP is, and if we look at local connections and remote connections. We have here the remote peers. The red dotted line are the local peers. This is the join rate, and as you can see, it's most likely, or they, you have a 2.5 higher rate, or two point uh, higher rate connection rate for remote peers over here, but on the other hand, which is also might be not that astonishing, that the churn rate is also definitely higher for remote peers. Because why, why that? As a remote peer, in the simplest case, you simply come by a reseller. The reseller, you may have an agreement which you can um, turn down within a month. And then you say, okay, just let me try out whether it makes sense to peer at another exchange. You do it for three months, six months, or maybe a year. And then you say, no, I don't have enough traffic. And then you simply turn down again. Whereas when you once have decided to put a router at a different place, um, you have committed for a line and so on and so on. The churn rate definitely 
is uh, lower. So what has remote peering from routing implementations? So they were interested in circuitous paths between ASs with one, more than one IXP in common. So this study was only carried out at DKIX in Frankfurt where they, they did trace route from all remote peers which were connected to more than one IXPs uh, to all the other ones and what they found out that in two thirds of the cases uh, the, there was hot potato routing that means the networks took the closest IXP to the remote peer but still in the rest in one third of the cases we didn't have uh, hot potato routing. That means we even took a longer route. There's also, if you want to find out more about it, this is a URL, which say there, there's a portal. You can look for ASs, and you will see whether they, and you can also click on, on an IXP. You can select the network and the IXP and then look what, in their meaning, what the connection is, local or remote. So, what is the conclusion? The takeaway is the new methodology is, is very accurate, way more accurate than simple rounded time. But what you have to do is, you really have to have a lot of information for example, port capacity, that means you have to work perhaps with IXPs, you have to more work with, with um, networks, with collocations to find about these matrix. But if you have that, then it's highly precise. And why are networks interested in, in these? For example, CDNs, they connect almost to every IXP in the world. And of course, CDNs only want to hand off traffic to peers that are more or less directly connected. And they somehow have to, have to find out. And typically, they also have sophisticated tools behind it to really find it out. But I guess it would be a great idea if there was a portal with a nice API. You just could say, OK, this network this IXP, please give me the information, whether it's local or it's, it's remote, and perhaps also give me back how far away for me this network is. Especially also because remote peering becomes more popular and, and popular. So what the researchers will do is they will have a more extensive analysis more including more IXPs and from my point of view what would be interesting what they did not uh, look into is whether um, in terms of stability whether there's a difference between local peers and re remote peers because you are not only interested in how far away the other peer is but also how stable your connection, especially your BGP connection, for example, to the other network is. There's also a paper referenced at the end of the presentation. It's um, 20 pages long. If you have time on your way home, please look into. Very interesting. Not easy to read sometimes, but worse. So that's it. And please, as I said, I'm, please speak loud and clearly because uh, maybe I'm saying three times, please repeat. Arnold Gavin from Megaport. Um, I had a question. Do you think um, IXs should help make this information more available about their members, where, they, where they're aware that they are remote peers? Once again. Uh, do you think IXs should actively make this information more accessible where my, they my, know they are remote? My, my personal opinion is yes, they definitely should do. Why? 
because the more information I give to my customers through the network to make a good decision where to route the traffic to the better for my customers. And, and one other one, uh, the, there was a large number of the, of the couple of large European exchanges that had 40% uh, who were remote peers. Did you do any correlation whether it's the same networks appearing remotely at all three European exchanges? I also didn't get Sorry, four. Um, the, was there any correlation with the number of the remote peers in the European IXs to so see I, if it was the same one? I ones? said I was not part of, of the research, so perhaps I cannot um, answer this question. So best is to ask Chris about that. Will do. Thank yeah. you. Any more questions? No? Then I would like to hijack this slot because I'm not. So what I do now is. Uh, <laughs> so now I'm speaking for Peering DP. I have to low. Now, to lower my voice, I'm now for Peering DP. And what we did is we have rebranded and we have also made nice t shirts. These are the t shirts. Unfortunately, they are Asian style. This is 2XL. And as you see, <laughs> I usually fit in XS, but <laughs> this time it does. And we also will have tomorrow in the first afternoon slot. We will have our first Peering DB tutorial where I talk about a little bit more in detail how Peering DB works. Thank you. Thanks, Arnold. Uh, next up is uh, Job Snyders from NTT. Uh, Job's going to chat about improving the Peering business case through. Uh, better routing, routing security and RPKI. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, thank you all for letting me be here on the stage. As you can see, I'm wearing my RPKI tie, so you know it's serious business. I'm Job Snyders. I work for NTT Communications, and today I would like to bring in front of you arguments that support origin validation in context of peering. Uh, and I will explain how direct peering with each other and RPKI origin validation are an excellent combination. Uh, in this presentation, I'll cover uh, the traditional benefits of peering and then slowly work up the case how RPKI origin validation changes the landscape. Uh, I've split it in recommendations for ISPs and recommendations for internet exchange operators. So, traditional peering. We reach large parts of the internet through intermediate networks, aka transit providers, and often there can be a uh, financial incentive to directly connect with each other. If you cut out the middleman, you'll be saving some money because arguably a cross-connect is cheaper than buying a full-fledged IP transit service. Um, there is operational simplicity because there is less uh, entities and devices in the middle uh, and the capacity management can be simpler as you have direct connections to each other. In the uh, top half you, you see uh, uh, the traditional case with a transit provider in the middle where the AS path is two hops and in the lower half we see direct peering uh, where the AS path is just one hop. And this will be crucial later on. This peering thing is not new. Arguably, we're sitting here in an interconnection track. Uh, and if we plot out the average AS path length as observed through RIPRIS uh, BGP collectors, we can see that for decades, the average AS path length has remained roughly the same. But we all know that the default free zone is growing. We are now at 67,000 ASNs in the default free zone. So as this number grows, uh, but the AS path length remains relatively stable, it means that peering is a popular thing. 
Fantastic. Now, let's go over some uh, hijack or misconfiguration scenarios. Uh, in this instance, we do not know if the attacker in the lower um, right, uh, AS15562, perhaps made a typo in their configuration or is plotting some malicious uh, attack where uh, they try and steal traffic from Google. But uh, let's go over the, the various uh, elements in this image. In the upper left, we have, as an example, Cloudflare. They use providers, uh, they use direct connections, and they'll see multiple paths towards the, I, the destination IP addresses, 185.25.28.0/23. Now, if an attacker manages to insert a slash 24 into uh, BGP feeds that propagate towards Cloudflare, from Cloudflare's perspective, there will be multiple paths, some of them slash 23s, but also the slash 24. And the rule in routing is that more specifics always win. So this uh, could mean that traffic, instead of flowing towards Google, is actually diverted uh, towards the attacker's ASN. This is unfortunate. In the case of direct peering, similar considerations apply if origin validation is not used. There's direct BGP sessions between uh, the attacker and, but also uh, Google. And again, the more specific wins, despite uh, AS paths being shorter. Now, enter RPKI ROAS. Google has published an RPKI uh, route origin authorization for their slash 23. And what is of note is that the maximum length they have specified for this prefix is also a slash 23. If Cloudflare does origin validation, we arrive at this scenario. Uh, on their edges, they could apply a invalid is reject policy. And this means that the moment they receive a BGP uh, route announcement from an attacker uh, that is more specific, this BGP update will be rejected because it does not comply with the origin validation. In other words, despite the slash 24 being a more specific and under uh, usual circumstances drawing traffic towards itself, if origin validation is applied in this scenario, the slash 23 wins. All right. Let's step up the tactics a little bit. The attacker turned out not to be a misconfiguration, but a uh, uh, entity um, that is actively trying to draw certain traffic towards themselves. So they modified their announcement from a slash 24 to a slash 23. However, in this scenario, the legitimate path towards Google still wins because Google 15169 is the only authorized origin ASN for this specific announcement, and the attacker's ASN is therefore invalid. Smart people in the room will immediately recognize that you can spoof ASNs because the AS path in BGP updates is not cryptographically verified. What the attacker in this instance could do is fake Google as an origin and thereby comply with the RPKI ROA. But what we see now is that the slash 23 that comes over direct sessions with Google still wins because the AS path through the attacker is longer. In other words, RPKI ROAS can help protect um, uh, against more specific announcements and direct peering in combination uh, with that attackers need to spoof their origins creates longer AS paths and therefore uh, the attacker can still not insert themselves between these two entities. In the ITF, um, there have been attempts to specify something called BGP-SEC, uh, which would allow cryptographic verification of AS paths. But this technology is not readily available in uh, today's widely used BGP implementations. And despite that, 
what I try and emphasize here is that we may not have formal path validation, but we do have path validation for one hop. Because usually when you turn up BGP sessions, you know who your peer is, the knocks are coordinating with each other, uh, you know which port things are uh, plugged into. And maybe one hop of path validation is enough uh, for all practical intents and purposes in today's internet, given that we seek to directly connect with each other uh, all the time for financial reasons. So in summary, BGP origin validation is a great defense mechanism against other people out there on the wide internet uh, mistyping prefixes and accidentally propagating these uh, typos to the wider internet. Origin validation, however, also helps block out more specific announcements. And if you combine that with actively pursuing to have the shortest AS path with the networks that matter to you, you have an incredibly strong defense against misconfigurations but also malicious attacks. Now, let's look at the IXP side of things, internet exchange points. Because at internet exchange points, we see lots of direct uh, sessions between participants. However, they have one vulnerable spot. Internet exchange peering land prefixes, uh, as the internet exchange grows, they grow as well. And if we take uh, DKX Frankfurt, they are currently operating their peering land fabric in a slash 21. And it's not uncommon to see that people have redistribute connected uh, configured on their BGP routers. They make a typo when they configure the interface pointing towards this internet exchange. And a more specific of the peering land prefix is redistributed in all or part of the default free zone. Now the issue with these more specifics and why they are incredibly damaging uh, for internet exchanges is that many BGP implementations send the BGP control packets uh, towards the best path. And again, a more specific announcement uh, usually wins over less specific announcements. Uh, and, and this could mean that all BGP sessions go down related to the block of IP addresses that is being hijacked. And this is, of course, uh, bad news for all involved. Other approaches to this problem would be to email everybody, can you please ensure that you only accept a slash 21 route, or even better, not accept the slash 21 route at all? But this is challenging. Every time you renumber into a new prefix, will you again email everybody and follow up with them whether they applied their filters correctly? Um, what happens if people simply not update their filters? Every filter that is not updated in this context is a new hole uh, through which these more specifics can escape. And then let's take in consideration that there's thousands of IXPs, at least more than three uh, in Europe. For all these IXPs, will we uh, send emails or, or use PeeringDB to uh, configure filters that are suitable? I think this is uh, too much to ask. So I would like to recommend IXP operators to instead create RPKI ROAS that cover their peering land prefixes. And be sure to set the maximum length of the RPKI ROA to be the same as the prefix length of the prefix that is used as the peering LAN um, interconnection point. You have two choices in this uh, uh, context. You can either use origin AS0 to signal to the world that this is a prefix that is not intended to be routed in the default free zone, or you set the ASN to your own services ASN. Most internet exchanges run their own ASN to provide DNS or web services. Um, and if you combine this with not advertising the prefix yourself, uh, we have a very effective mechanism of distributing what prefixes at what prefix length should or should not be visible. And this scales much, much better than having to email people uh, 
about uh, uh, filtering IXP peering LAN prefixes on their border filters. Another consideration I'd like to offer the room, uh, specifically IXP operators, is uh, related to route servers. Very quick recap on what route servers do. The idea of route servers is that they are a convenient service uh, for the members. If you are unwilling to spend a lot of time pursuing uh, the setup of direct BGP sessions with uh, newcomers to the internet exchange, you could choose to connect to a route server and any newcomers that also connect to the route server, uh, their routes will be propagated to you and there's nothing that you need to configure on your site. Fantastic. In this context, traffic still flows directly from participant to participant, but BGP updates go through an intermediate rendezvous point, the route server. And route servers were intended to mimic direct peering. However, the moment you have an ASN that was assigned to you by an RER, and this ASN engages in eBGP sessions uh, and is uh, part of route propagations, uh, you have responsibilities as an internet exchange operator. And when your internet exchange participants create RPKI ROAS, to me, that is a very strong signal that they would like those RPKI ROAS to be honored. And the moment you operate a BGP speaker, even if it's supposed to be a transparent intermediate surface, I expect uh, that this is taken as a signal about what should and should not be propagated. In other words, from internet exchanges, I expect leadership in this regard uh, and that they also consider rejecting invalid BGP announcements instead of transparently passing those through. We discussed the benefits of RPKI origin validation in context of direct peering. The same benefits apply uh, if origin validation is applied on route servers. Therefore, I would strongly advise all internet exchange operators to implement RPKI origin validation. It benefits their uh, constituents. And there's no reason not to, because modern day BGP implementations capable of performing route server functionality support uh, RPKI origin validation. IXP Manager, which will be covered in much more detail later this week, can help generate the correct configurations to do origin validation. A route server, uh, another open source package to help generate uh, uh, route server configurations has support for RPKI origin validation. BERT as a BGP speaker can do it, OpenBGPD can do it. But if you would, for instance, use uh, Junos uh, or Cisco, those also have origin validation uh, capabilities. So there is no lack of software to accomplish this goal. And if you deploy origin validation on your route servers, you'll find yourself in excellent company. Uh, there's a multitude of internet exchanges that are already doing origin validation, and I expect that list to grow in the coming months. Uh, we'll be keeping track of that on the peering.exposed URL. So in summary, IXP operators, please, create RPKI ROAS for your peering LAN prefixes. It will reduce the negative impact of uh, more specifics being accidentally distributed uh, by your participants. And similarly to protect your participants and honor their requests for uh, uh, how their routes should be uh, uh, seen, uh, enforce a invalid is reject policy on your route servers. And with that, I would like to open up the microphone for questions, comments, concerns, insights. Um, also feel free to later uh, reach out through email. I am always available, even if you are my competitor, or if you have questions how to implement uh, RPKI origin validation in your network or on your route servers, I can help with this as well as I've uh, accumulated some experience in that field.
Hi, Anurag from Hurricane Electric. I hear that uh, the next version of, uh, of IRR, the software which runs on the, on, the route, uh, on the internet routing registry side, is going to support a check for the RPKI. So if there is a, there is a conflict in ROA versus the route object, it's going to reject that. Um, is that correct? Yes. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of what is meant with this. When we talk about RPKI-based BGP origin validation, the original design of this mechanism was that you take a BGP update that comes from an uh, eBGP neighbor, and you can validate that update against the RPKI ROA table on your edge router. And then it's either valid or invalid, and based on that you can make a choice to reject or accept the route. And the same logic can be applied to IRR route objects. IR route objects, similar to BGP updates, are composed of a prefix and an origin, and these can be validated using the origin validation procedure as described in RFC 6811. Uh, and tomorrow at 10, I will be explaining in, in great detail uh, what the expectations are uh, of, of using RPKI data inside IRR demons. Um, but the philosophy is, RPKI data is far more trustworthy than IRR data. We can cryptographically verify that the owner of the prefix was the one that uh, signaled their routing intentions. Uh, and these wishes or, or requests uh, can be honored not just in BGP best path selection, but also in uh, the IRRD software. And this will bring a much needed cleanup to the IRR uh, problem space. Since you mentioned cleanup, uh, well, I think it may be more appropriate to ask this tomorrow, but just, just still curious. What happens to registries like RADB, which mirror lots of other IRRs? So would this check apply only when you update RADB, or would this check apply when it's, it gets updates from, from the sync from other IRRs? All of it. Okay, cool. When it's mirrored, when it's updated, uh, when, when IRR data is redistributed uh, by Adding this check to the IRD software itself, uh, we can very easily uh, propagate the behavior in the wider ecosystem. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Any other questions related to origin validation and, and peering? Hearing none, 